I'm Nirbhik. Uh, I've been a Gnome contributor since 2004, 2007, sorry. And um, I'm here to talk about how to make your Gnome app compile two and a half times faster. Except that that's a bit of a lie. Um, so this was the original benchmarking which I did. And uh, that's not actually what I'm getting now because that was on a, on a hard disk. And now I have a uh, SSD. So everything is a little, or it was a bit faster. So the talk is actually making your Gnome app 40% faster. But that is also a lie. We are not going to talk about that. <laughs> First, we're going to talk about 40 years of build systems. We began several decades ago with GNU Make. Then came GNU Auto Tools when people realized that they needed to actually build across multiple platforms. Then people started to hate it, and they made a lot of stuff like WAF, SCONS, CMake, JIP, and the list goes on. And yet, we still use Auto Tools. Why is that? I mean, this is roughly what our tools look like. And um, right, so I bet half of these things are stuff we never even think about. And the rest half is stuff we want to not think about. And this graph is incomplete. It doesn't talk about lib tool and all of these things. Said tr awk grep. I mean, did you know that configure still requires an awk from 1978? I mean, it, it, it tests for that. So we have great backward compatibility, I guess. I mean, whenever I think about this sort of thing, I just feel like this. Sorry, uh, this. No. I mean, AIX, I don't, I've never even seen an AIX machine. But probably because I'm too young, but I don't think we use any of those interix compile pick because of a broken GCC, OK. And I mean, this is the size of a generated configure. You can write an entire build system in that. And that's what we're going to talk about next. And I mean, I guess some person was wrong when he said this. We can't even configure without with just that. OK, so why do we actually use auto tools, right? Um, it works, right? It has served us well so far. And I mean, it works out of the box on every distro. Cross-compilation works. Auto tools made the standard on how to cross-compile with the host machine, build machine, and target machine uh, standards. But why do we really use auto tools? Right? That's just the way reason why auto tools is um, one of the best auto, uh, build systems out there. But not one of the best, I would say. More like one of the most um, standardized, sort of say. But why do we use it? It's mostly these three things: technical debt because it's there, it's been around for a while, it's way too much work to move GNOME off of auto tools. Inertia, well, similar in so many ways. And there is a known system. We all know how it works. We can make it work with our systems. And libraries which use that can be used with other things. And we know how it all works. We don't have to worry about how, hey, CMake, how do we make that work? So, but like the problem is that we are able to use it because we don't actually need to think about it. We just do cargo control programming. We take a macro, we look at configure file, hey, we want to add a new option, just copy paste, and we hope it works. And that, that macro calls another macro, which calls more macros and more shell tools and creates megs of mega megabytes of shell, and we hope it works. And the other reason is that we have an entire ecosystem around it. You know, We have GTK doc, docbook, gresource, get, get text, intel tool used to be there. Uh, we have schemas, object introspection, everything. Everything is there. And you know, the most important reason why we use auto tools is actually PKG config and the library conventions which have been set around that. The way we have stable uh, ABIs and APIs is set by auto tools. And so we, by using that, we know that it's going to work. But now, we have an alternative. An alternative is called Mason. Um, Mason is written in Python 3. Uh, it generates it. Uh, there are build files which generate Ninja build files, which then uses Ninja to, of course, compile everything. And it's had two years of development, about 33 contributors. And the usage is really simple. You just do this. You make a build directory. You run Mason, and then you run Ninja. It always builds out of tree, as a normal, like the usual stuff which you have for a build system. Out of tree, detects source code changes, so you can just type Ninja, and it'll reconfigure if required. It'll only rebuild whatever is changed. Standard make stuff. But why should you use it? That's the question, right? It's not much different from CMake so far, or JIP, or anything else. The reason is that Mason 
is made for GNOME. Mason uses PKG config for all external dependencies. That's the standard. If you don't use that, then you're like, okay, you can kind of find a library and stuff, but that's not optimal because the PKG config file gives you the headers, gives you library paths, gives you what libraries to uh, link to when shared or static, everything else there. So we, so Mason does use PKG config for everything. And the most important part beyond that for GNOME is that it already has all the infrastructure in there. We have a GNOME module from which you can compile schemas, generate GIS, GDK doc, whatever else you want to do. Everything is there. And beyond that, beyond what is specific for GNOME, we have that Mason is built from the ground up to be usable. The build, system, the build file syntax is readable. It's inspired from Python. And unlike something like CMA Quarter Tools, it, is, it tries to um, make some, try to, try to give you a format which is similar to either Python or C and it makes you feel good while reading it. So I'll give you an example of what it looks like. Uh, this is a very basic Hello World program. Um, you have a library which you'll want to link to an application. And this is all you need. It's really simple, in my opinion. And um, you, you have keyword arguments, and uh, all strings are in single quotes, so you don't have any weird, hey, do we escape double quotes or not kind of thing. And um, yeah, so. I mean, when I found this, I was really happy with uh, how the, at least the system looks. And the important thing also here is that um, the way Mason works and the way other systems now work, but coming from auditors, you might not realize this, but it does configuration and substitution in one step. So you go from, so what, whatever you do in configure and autoconf and automake, all of that is done in one step. So you have a build file, it directly does all the configuration, all the substitution in whatever you need to do, and gives you a build.ninja file at the end. And another thing that is really important, I feel, is that language is not Turing complete, and it will never be. It's, I think it's really important that we do this, because otherwise you just have a mess of, because you need to be able to read a build file and know exactly what it does in one glance. You don't want to have to pass it like you do your code to figure out how it works. So there's no macros, you can't define functions, and there's no infinite loops. There's loops, a for each loop is there, which makes sense, but there's, you can't write a programming language out of it. But this, this usually means that what you see is what you get effectively. You don't have nested macros everywhere. And Mason is also explicit. It forgive, is forgiving. For instance, if you have a keyword argument which takes a list of arguments, if you give it a single argument, it will happily take it. Um, it's extensible in a sense that um, if, you, if the default provided functions don't do what you want, we had generator support. So you can have an arbitrary generator which takes a command and input and output, and it will generate it for you. Um, and that's, that's, that's one of the good nice things about Mason. So far when we've used it in GStreamer, we haven't had any problems with something being missing, but it has been we've added it to GStreamer, to Mason, which is another important part. Mason is not a platform which you have to assume is gonna stay static, unlike other tools. You, if you have something which you feel is gonna be useful to other people, add it to Mason. We're happy to have it in our, in our system. So it's not a static product. Don't think of it as something, don't think of it as like, GCC or glibc, all the glibc has been changing in that sense these days too, so that's also good. The next thing is that Mason is fast. It's been made to be fast from first principles. Unlike uh, auto tools where, for instance, if you, do, if you don't do recursive, then it's really slow because it's really difficult to read your build file as if your project is large enough. And if you do recursive, then automake does not know whether each subdirectory has a dependency between each other, so it waits while uh, doing some directories. And, but Mason does not do that. It creates a single uh, dependency tree of the entire um, build files. And, can, um, and since it uses Ninja, it's able to, um, what's it called? Able to decide what to build really fast and, it's, and, and is uh, highly parallel in that sense. And it's written in Python, so it could even be faster if you want it, if it's a bottleneck. So this configuration is really fast. Um, how fast? We'll take a look at it now. And Ninja is even faster. Because I was actually surprised by how fast, how much faster Ninja is than Make. Because even if you have just a flat Make file, Ninja is still faster. And I really I have to uh, do a perf on it. I'm not sure why it happens. But the numbers are this. Autos versus Mason, GCC Linux, i5, um, four cores. Um, this is on SSD. 48 seconds for glib autogen plus configure. And 103 seconds for building it, while Mason is eight seconds and 72 seconds. So it's about twice as fast, roughly. 
and the same for GStreamer. And this is because this is when you have a project with very little load, uh, like average overhead for auto tools. When you have something like GC plugins base or good, which has several small directories with each with one or two C files, the difference is even larger. The next important thing about Mason is that it has a lot of language support. It supports Vala, Python, C, C++, Rust. And if you have a language which you use, we'd be happy to add support for it. Just come to us, send a pull request, or even open a bug, help us with it, and we'll add support for you. The next thing, which opens up new possibilities for a software project, is that it supports a lot of tool chains. GCC, CLang, MinGW. This is the first three are what is supported by Auto Tools and Sigwin as well if you are a masochist. Uh, and then there's MSVC, which Auto Tools cannot do unless you use weird wrappers and even then you're building on Windows and you just hate your life. And the <laughs> and the um, and then the, we have uh, three backends: Ninja, Visual Studio, and Xcode. So Ninja is a default backend on Linux and other platforms unless you want to build output Visual Studio project files, then you can do that, just like CMake. But we feel like our implementation is a little bit nicer. Um, then there's Xcode, which needs a little bit of love, but it's still there. The next thing is that we support all the platforms that GNOME cares about and GStreamer cares about. So, and the nicer part of this is also that cross-compilation works, I think, better than auto-tools. Because unlike having to specify on a command line on the list of um, of variables and having set environment variables to specify what you what you require. You can just have a single file. It looks kind of like this. So you can specify a cross info file with the system, CPU, and whatever binaries are there. And you can even have an optional section called properties, where you can actually uh, specify which functions are available. So you don't have to do a test which involves running a binary because when you're cross compiling, you can't necessarily do that. But if you do want to run a binary, we also have an exe wrapper. So it'll automatically run that run a binary through that exe wrapper if you need to do that. Now, after all of this, we come to GStreamer. And why did we use Mason? Um, there were a lot of reasons, but the primary reasons for reason for us was that our Windows story is kind of crap. It's we have um, a build a build wrapper sort of thing called Cerbero, uh, which does build on Linux, OS 10, and Windows. But it's not the best experience. It literally takes a day to build everything, even though it takes just like two or three hours on Linux at most. Then another thing we used to complain to us about a lot was that it had really bad debugging support. Because if you're building with MinGW, then you cannot, um, you don't have intercompatibility with the PDB format, which MSVC uses. So if you want to debug in Visual Studio, then you're out of luck. And if you want to debug in GDB and your application links to some uh, Visual Studio, some native, native Windows libraries, you're out of luck again. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of a mess. The next thing was that if you're using C++, your life is just hell because exceptions, uh, set long jump, uh, set jump long jump is how MGW does it. GCC does it on Windows, and MSVC uses safe exception handling, and those are not, not compatible. So if you link them both together, you can't expect to use exceptions. And Qt has already solved this on Windows. So they have MSVC binaries, which use safe exception handling. And if you build linking against that, everything is fine, which I think is one of the reasons why a lot of people have been moving away from GDK as a platform. But that's a different topic altogether. And so because of this, GStreamer likes Mason. We ported GStreamer to Mason. And the process was as close as you can get to enjoyment. I'm talking about build systems, because being a Genju developer, I still have an ex developer, I still have nightmares from that time. So this was this is not going to add to my nightmares, most likely. So we ported these li uh, libraries, libfi, glib, orc. G orc is a uh, library that GCMO uses for runtime compilation. Uh, and then the plugins, uh, basic plugins. And in the process, we also improved Mason's Windows support. Uh, it was already there, but we had to. Uh, Make some changes to how, for instance, library names are naming is done. Naming scheme should be um, compiler dependent. If you're building with GW, you want lib foo.dll with the version somewhere. But if you're building with MSVC, you want foo.dll because that's the standard with MSVC. Things like that. And now that we have Mason build files, everything kind of makes sense. You don't have to, you know, guess what something is going to do. You don't have to, you know, have you, if you have C flags or LD uh, LD add lib uh, LD add in your uh, automake file, it's um, you know, it's 
substituting a variable which can have n number of flags and if something changes somewhere else, it will cascade through the build system and it's just such a such a mess to use auto-tools generally. And the other nice thing is that building on Windows is so much easier now because there are fewer dependencies. We don't use shell, we don't use m4, grep, whatever else. You do not need a kitchen sink to build on Windows. You just need Python and Ninja and Mason. That's it. Plus whatever else you actually need to build your stuff, which can be GTK doc or get text or whatever else. And everything actually builds faster. We actually have a build happening 10 times faster on Windows now. It's actually tolerable. It, instead of taking a day, it just takes a few hours. Now, the, the thing which takes the most amount of time to build on Windows is get text. We want to also get rid of that. I mean, try to make it uh, distribute binaries maybe for that or something else. There's no recursion, there's no shell. And on Windows, that's, you know, if you fork anything at all, it just slows everything down. So building on Windows does not take a day. And as an advantage, building on embedded devices does not take two days. You built an RPI last year, Juicy did a uh, talk and he started to configure on an ARM device. Finished his talk, it was still going on. It's like, okay, fine, screw that. I'll build Mason now. So that's exactly how it happens. And now because of all of this, new things are possible. You know, you can build with the Visual Studio compiler. You can have, if you have an application that uses Visual Studio, you can link to GStreamer or glib and you won't hate yourself for your build system. And the fact that there's no uh, that there's no debugging to uh, that there's no you know debugging is really hard is no longer an issue you can debug inside visual studio you can even generate project files and you can even develop inside visual studio if you want to i mean i don't know who would want to do that but there are people who do that so you can do that if you really want to and for a lot of people actually complain to us they wanted to integrate with the symbol servers so if you if you are developing a game and you want to use glib you want to have symbol servers. And if you have glib, suddenly you don't have any symbols. That's kind of important for them. And so we have, um, we're going to merge this next week as an alternative build system for GStreamer. We are not quite moving away from what it was yet. We hope to do it in the future. The port still requires some work on our side. Um, it's a, as, as I talked about earlier, there's a lot of inertia. There's a lot of, um, the infrastructure is there, the system is in place. We need to, move away from it, and it requires a lot of work. So we're going to do it slowly. And we hope to one day be able to get rid of auto tools. Um, although on the other hand, some parts have already moved forward to Mason completely. PTV and GC Transcoder, thanks to Tiblo, uh, have already, already have releases with Mason. Debian right now has, thanks to Sebastian, has a release with Mason in it. And we think it's the future. And so we want everybody to try it out, because that's the only way that a build system can indeed do what we need to do. We need to be able to use it and fix it. And so the question to how to make your GNOME compile faster, ditch auto tools. Use Mason. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Hi. So the before after numbers you presented uh, was that with parallel make because as far as I know Ninja runs in parallel by default while make. Does. Yes, it was with make J5, uh, which is also what Ninja does. By okay. default, it's n plus one. Ninja is actually so fast that it locks up my system and I build it by default. I don't know what's wrong with the scheduler, but. Everything just becomes, sorry, go on. Okay, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one is traditionally with the CMake where you have like the, the Windows project file generation. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's great because you get people developing on, on Windows, yeah. but the biggest problem I've seen from that historically on other projects mm -hmm. is it's very difficult to get their changes still upstream because they're using a generated project file. Right. So they still have to learn your build system right, and go right. through that whole process. Yeah, yeah. Is there, I mean, it seems like Mason has tools already to do a lot of the refactoring or ch build changing, build to some changes. Mm -hmm. Is it worthwhile to invest in giving them a tool to go from that generated project file and get that stuff back into the Mason build file? I'll let you see answer that. So the internal project format of Visual Studio is XML and it's interesting and trying to detect changes from that and actually getting them. There's actually a product available that you can buy which does 
diffs for your Visual Studio project files so you can put them in Git. And this is a thing that actually sells because it's so terribly difficult. Um, and I don't think that we can get to the point where you just change stuff in Visual Studio and then it comes back without help from Microsoft. So what I've been talking about with Christian is that we want to provide uh, kind of like if you know CMake server or something similar where, where you can say if we provide this, this executable like like say add this file to this target and then it does and if then some, somehow someone can hook that up to Visual Studio if it has these hooks then it could be made to work. But um, in, unless we get help from that it's probably not going to happen. I also note that uh, I worked with one developer who who was like a Windows fan. He was always using Visual Studio. And uh, I sat down, sat down with him for a day and I explained to him how the build files work. And afterwards, he was actually happier because in Visual Studio, you need to click five times to make anything, make any changes. While in Mission, you just add something. It's like, this is actually really simple. So I think that um, people would be happy to learn it out, learn if they want to. Hey. Do you have uh, a JH build module type for Mizon so that if people port their apps, then JH build will still build them? Do we? Not yet, right? No. Uh, but we probably will because, I mean, that's the sort of thing which uh, comes as apps start using it, right? So the, the infrastructure will start converting once people start. Once the need is there, it will happen. So we're happy to help in that. Thanks. Uh, JH build or idea is a CMake um, like module, uh, porting it to uh, use Mizen instead would be pretty much trivial. So it's not going to take uh, that long to do that. Um, but I wanted to say that I, uh, um, I wrote a blog post when I ported uh, Graphene to test Mizen. Uh, Graphene is the small library that GTK will depend on soon. Um, the uh, Mizen uh, sped up everything by at, at least a factor of two. Uh, the Ninja is incredibly fast. It's so fast, it's not even funny. Uh, and I have to say that um, UC and uh, Nibik have been incredibly helpful uh, um, when I had any questions whatsoever about uh, Mizen and implemented uh, fixes. Uh, hacking on Mizen itself uh, is... Um, I'm not going to say a joy because it's Python, and <laughs> but it's incredibly, uh, incredibly rewarding and faster than hacking on M4. So, <laughs> I, I, I'm uh, very, very, very much impressed by this project, and I, I hope to be porting my project soon to to it. Thank you for the kind words. What's the equivalent of make check? Uh, you just do Ninja now. test. So there's we have functions for adding tests, and Ninja then we generate a build file in which the test can be run through a wrapper which we have. So you can just do Ninja test and it'll run that. We already have checks uh, make check in GStreamer. We have it working for that. Cool. And is there a way to sort of this is building on something that doesn't really exist in Auto Tools? Is there a way to run them under a wrapper like say Valgrind? Yes. Uh, we have custom targets and we have generators. So you can take an arbitrary command with arbitrary co uh, command line, arbitrary input files, input, arbitrary output files. You specify what they will be like, and it will just create a build file for that. You want to say something? <laughs> yeah, so we have native support for Valgrin, so there's test Valgrin target. Uh, and in addition, uh, our goal is that we export everything as JSON. So there's an executable called Meson Introspect. And you can ask it to like give me all the targets, give me all the tests, give me everything. And then it gives you all of this information in JSON file. Like for tests, you get what executable to run, what directory you do need to be in, what are the command line arguments, what are the environment variables. And you can do whatever you want with that. And speaking of the, the speed, one of the complaints that we actually get from people is that when you build with Ninja, it's actually so fast and takes so much resources that tabbing between windows becomes laggy. Which is a nice problem to have. It's kind of like, this car goes too fast. Um, so last year you mentioned uh, that it was possible to um, uh, tap into other Mason projects from one project and build the whole thing into one. Uh, and uh, my question is: Have you, have you, have you played with that in in any way that it relates to uh, Flatpak, so that you make the bundling like a one step instead of? 
Okay, so it, <laughs> spoil this a bit. So I'm going to have a talk at LAS Gnome, which is next month, and and this is going to be one of the things there. And the the point is that there's uh, about a thousand different ways in which you package your dependencies. Like this Flatback Builder, which has like it downloads files and puts them all stuff. And Snappy has one, and Cerbero has one, and every single comp company out there has one because they take source. And the sub project thing that, that that Alberto was mentioning is that what you should do is that you should have all of this inside of your build system so that you, you can take any Mesen project and use it as a sub project. And then when you say, uh, I want a dependency on, say, glib. And then you can set it up so that if glib is available on the system, it will just use the system one. And if it's not available, then it downloads and builds it. And then you can use it directly. Yeah. And this will work on all platforms, including Windows, OS X, and whatever you have. Uh, quick question. How does uh, Mason compare with Automake in terms of automatically editing? Like if you wanted to write code to edit uh, the Mason configuration versus Automake, how would you compare that? Automatically write like, the Like, say I wanted to have in GNOME Builder mm -hmm. add this source file to the project. Mm. Do we have an API for that yet? Okay, so currently we don't have direct support for that. But what we want to do is to create an executable for, for rewriting the thing. So like add this file to this target and then expose it as an executable and then every IDE can just use that. If VI people want to add support, they just call into that. But it's not there yet. So while it's cool for like ra building random stuff, I don't think you want the build system downloading things from the network in, in a official build system. Like Flatpak always downloads things outside in a controlled fashion and then launches everything in a no network, no access to anything, kind of like sandbox. So, and that's by design because we don't want it to do whatever. Um. So when we download stuff, uh, there's always checksums, and they're always verified that they're there. But the thing is that if you pre-download your stuff, or just put your like source file, source directories inside the sub-projects folder, it will just use them directly, and it doesn't download them. Yeah. So you can do anything at all. In fact, um, PTV has a GitHub module for sub-projects. So it does not use the RabDB stuff at all. It just does a GitHub module and fetches it and does it itself. So we're out of time for questions, but uh, feel free to grab uh, Yussi and Nabik um, throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.